During the long years of the Dark Ages, the sight which brought dread and terror to the inhabitants of Britain was the first glimpse of an unfamiliar sail on the horizon. All too often, this unwelcome event was the first herald of a Viking raid, the harbinger of death and destruction. The wolves of Odin were about to be unleashed again. Age of the Vikings, which saw the Norsemen rise from occasional pirates to the undisputed rulers of Britain, was to last for 300 years. The first recorded raids on Britain took place in 787 AD, and by the time of the last Viking army to invade England in 1066, they had brought destruction and conquest to every part of these unhappy islands. Written records for the time of the Viking ascendancy the long period between the end of the Roman Empire and the beginning of the medieval period are scarce indeed. Our lack of knowledge concerning these mysterious centuries is the chief reason why they have become known as the Dark Ages. Despite the huge gaps in our understanding of this remote age, there are still some rays of light which penetrate the gloom. The chief among them is the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, a record of the main events in Britain from the birth of Christ until 1154 AD. The Chronicle is not a single continuous work, but a collection of annals written by monks in various monasteries around England. The earliest years are naturally sketchy, and sometimes the entries can be as short as a single line. By the time of the first Viking raids in the 8th century, there is at least a complete entry for each year. We are fortunate, therefore, to have a record through contemporary eyes of the principal events of the entire Viking era. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is also most unusual for a document of its time because it was actually written in Old English and not Latin. Almost without exception, Official records of this type would have been written in Latin, the universal language of the church. So we are fortunate that we have not only a complete record of the era, but one which is written in the language of the people of the time. Indeed, the Chronicle is one of only three histories from the whole of Northern Europe to be written in a native tongue prior to the medieval period. The first entry which deals with the Viking raiders is for the year 785 AD. In this year, Beortic took Edba, daughter of King Offa, to be his wife. In his days came the first three ships of the Norwegians. The King's Reeve wrote to them and tried to compel them to go to the royal manor, for he did not know what they were, and they slew him. These were the first ships of the Danes to come to England. A Reeve was a royal official who represented the King in matters of taxation and trade at local level. The unfortunate man killed by the raiders would therefore become the first recorded casualty of the Viking Wars. As the sad liturgy of bloodstained entries for a large number of subsequent years testifies, he was not to be the last. If you read the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, you find every year mentions of great waves of Viking incursions into the, what we now call the British Isles. It was an endemic problem. Once it became clear that they could get fairly easy loot in Britain, and even some treaties with kings who would pay Dane gold to get them to go away again at the end of the season, of course we became a natural target in these islands. But what has always fascinated me is that it was not only us who were receiving this treatment. A little later on in history, you'll find Viking fleets sailing all the way round into the Mediterranean as far as Sicily and even to Constantinople. 
And in the St. Sophia, the great cathedral, and now a great mosque, of course, in Istanbul, right up in the gallery in the great dome, there are some runes that have been carved with a knife in the marble of the balustrade. Godric was here. This was a sort of a ninth century uh, vandal, shall we say, hard at work, like many of them in future generations, bored to death with the service going on below, taking out his dagger and carving his name on the building. From the first recorded raid, the chronicle runs for eight years without mention of the Vikings. The next reference to raiders is not until 793 AD, when they made their second incursion. This time, the raid was in far greater strength, with far more determined purpose. The raiders chose as their target the church and monastery on the island of Lindisfarne, off the coast of Northumberland. Lindisfarne was a relatively remote outpost of Christianity and must have presented an easy target. It is hardly likely that the few treasures of the abbey could not have been extorted without bloodshed. But cruelty and violence appear to have been an integral feature of the Norsemen's raids from the beginning. Already, the familiar bloodstained trail was beginning to take shape, as the records of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle for 793 and 794 AD bears witness. A great famine followed, and a little after, the marauding heathens destroyed the Lord's Church on Lindisfarne with great slaughter and pillage. And Northumberland was also ravaged by the heathen, and Egfrith's monastery and Jarrow looted. One of their leaders was slain there, and some of their ships were shattered by storms, and many of them were drowned there. Some came ashore alive, but they were killed at once by the mouth of the river. This is the island of Lindisfarne as it looks today, peaceful and untroubled. But with a little effort, it is not too difficult to summon up the ghosts of the past, especially in such a haunting spot as this. We came here on the 1200th anniversary of that first terrible Viking visit. And it is sobering indeed to look down the long corridor of time to ponder whether our own humble record will stand even the faintest chance of surviving more than a thousand years hence. In doing so, we can begin to glimpse some of the miracle by which the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle has survived its long journey through time. The Viking raiders who pillaged the monastery on Lindisfarne in 793 AD originated from Scandinavia, either Norway, Sweden or Denmark. The exact origin of the term Viking is itself obscure. It was almost exclusively a word used by the Norsemen to describe themselves. The chronicle refers to them as Dini, Danai or simply heathens. The roots of the word have been lost but it has been suggested that it stems from Vik, a region in Norway, or from the Norwegian name which means fjord or bay. Whatever the source of the name, it would appear that the writers of the time cared little to know the exact country from which their tormentors originated. The term Danes is often used to describe raiders who in fact originated from the other Scandinavian countries, and many of these Danes would actually have been Swedes or Norwegians. Regardless of where they originated, the end result of an early Viking raid was inevitably the same. Robbery, pillage and slaughter. Over the years, there have been a number of theories as to why the Viking raiders should suddenly appear off the shores of Britain towards the end of the 8th century. The two most widely accepted reasons are either that the population explosion which took place in Scandinavia at the time forced the bands of warriors to look outwards for new conquests or alternatively that the Viking raids had merely been transferred from their traditional hunting grounds of northern France. In France at the time, the increasingly sophisticated defences of the empire established by Charlemagne the Great reduced the possibility of a successful raid, so the Norsemen were forced to look elsewhere. Yet another theory postulates that the increased mercantile trade of Charlemagne's empire actively drew the Vikings southwards and onto Britain by default. 
Whether the roots of the Viking raids can be ascribed to one or more of these theories is likely to remain in contention, but on one topic, all of the leading authorities are in complete agreement. It was the revolution in the Scandinavian shipbuilding techniques which made the Viking expansion possible. During the second half of the 8th century, the first Viking longships first began to be produced. These ships were designed purely for war and raiding. And in terms of the technology of the day, they represented a huge leap forward in design. They were perfect craft for seaborne raiders. The old high sides of previous ships were dispensed with in order to produce a low-sided, long, thin ship, which drew very little water. Crucially, these craft were flat-bottomed, which meant that although they could carry a comparatively large number of men, they did not need a harbour and could be beached or landed almost anywhere with a minimum of ceremony. In consequence, these sleek craft could move with great speed and also travel long distance up rivers, allowing them to be used to attack undefended towns and villages, which in previous years would naturally have considered themselves safe from seaborne attack. The longships also allowed for an equally quick departure if resistance proved to be too strong. As early as the Roman era, Scandinavian ships had been noted for the fact that both sterns and bows were curved into a high graceful shape. By the 8th century, however, the familiar dragon head figures had begun to appear on the prow of the longships, giving them their popular name of dragon ships. It is not difficult to imagine the terror which the sight of such ships would have brought to the islanders. These were the famous longships, which have become synonymous with the Viking raiders. Capable of being propelled either by the wind in the single sail or by anything up to 35 pairs of oars in the very largest ships, they were supremely manoeuvrable and provided the Norsemen with the perfect means to begin their conquests. There is a body of evidence to support the suggestions that the Vikings used these ships to travel considerably beyond the confines of Europe, to Africa and even to America. These long sea journeys must have been extremely hazardous in such frail craft. But modern reconstructions of Viking longships have successfully completed many of the journeys which had previously been thought impossible, including the crossing of the Atlantic, which was completed by a reproduction longship as early as 1895. The longships was the most developed type of naval architecture of this age, and indeed for many an age to come. They are beautiful craft, they're highly skilled in their design, and they were highly capable of going over long distances. Sometimes there were hundreds of them involved in fleets. Uh, Harold Hadrada and Tostig's fleet, for example, which invaded the northeastern coast in 1066 in the first phase of the year, which ends with Hastings, of course, is said by the chroniclers to have had something like 250 ships with him. The first Viking raids were just that, short, sharp, violent forays in search of plunder and captives. From 835 AD, scarcely a year passes in which the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle does not record a Viking raid, some in considerable force. In 837, Wolfherd, the elder man, is recorded as successfully fighting off a force of 33 ships at Southampton. The native Anglo-Saxons, however, had less success in fighting off the Vikings in the following three years, following Wolfherd's successful battle. In each of the three years, 838, 839, and 840 AD, the chronicle tells an unremitting tale of slaughter and pillage wrought by the Viking raiders. In 851, however, came a major change of behavior by the raiders, when for the first time, the Vikings stayed on through the winter. This was to be the first stage of the colonization and eventual subjugation of the entire nation. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle takes up the story with the entry for the year 857 AD. 
In this year, the Alderman sealed with the men of Devon fought against the heathen at Wickensbury. There they made great slaughter and won the victory. The same year, King Athelstan destroyed a large host at Sandwich in Kent. They captured nine ships and drove off the rest. The heathens remained over the winter for the first time. In the same year, 350 ships arrived at the mouth of the Thames. They stormed Canterbury and London and put Beatwulf, King of Mercia, to flight. So attractive was a fertile and comparatively wealthy group of islands. At that time, most of Britain still lay under a huge blanket of forest, where wild boar, wolves and bears roamed at will. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle describes the Weald, a great forest which covered most of present-day Kent, Sussex and Hampshire, as being 30 miles broad and over 120 miles long. In this unspoiled wilderness, the occupants of Dark Age England enjoyed what was, by the standards of the day, a relatively prosperous lifestyle. There were few large towns, and most of the population lived in small villages or hamlets, which were centred upon the long house of the local lord. Arts and crafts flourished to a high standard, and the inhabitants of Britain were noted for the comparative quality and finery of their dress. Society at the time was, of course, strictly hierarchical. The king, of any one of the seven petty kingdoms of which England and southern Scotland were composed at the beginning of the Viking Age, ruled absolutely, or as absolutely as his strength allowed, for there were numerous plots and power struggles, generally resulting in an unpleasant end for one side or other. There was also a constant intercerstine war between the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms and the older Celtic peoples, still holding out to the west, predominantly in Wales. The kings of the day were, of course, expected to lead their armies into battle personally. So the attrition rate on rulers of the various Dark Age kingdoms was very high indeed. Beneath the king were his earls and eldermen, who ruled smaller sections of the kingdom on his behalf. In return for the king's patronage, they were obliged to raise his troops in times of war. This they did from among the next layer down in society. These were the local thanes, each of whom ruled a village. They were obliged to bring with them the local freemen and any members of their retinue who could bear arms. Together, the thanes and freemen were known as the feared, whom the king would call up in defense of the realm against the heathen raiders. Anglo-Saxon armies learnt the hard way how to fight and eventually beat the Viking and Danish menaces. Tactically, this meant in part the development of the famous Shield Wall. And so by the time of 1066 and the Battle of Stamford Bridge in that year, the Anglo-Saxons had developed a very much more superior fighting method on land than that of their opponents from the Nordic countries. But what is so fascinating in that particular year is that having won Stamford Bridge under King Harold, they then have to rush south again, of course, on their horses for mobility to reform the shield wall at Hastings, or Senlac Hill, as it is sometimes called, and then they are attacked by a force using cavalry and archers, missiles and mobility as their main means of fighting. And this is a transitional moment in warfare, as far as England is concerned. We're about to move from the age of the all fighting on foot, shield wall, uh, staunched together, great massed formations, to the idea of mobility and, above all, of using missile power to weaken an enemy before you come to grips with him. It is a fascinating moment in history. The men whom the Anglo-Saxons were gathered to fight were very different in many respects to their opponents. But perhaps the chief difference which marked them apart was that while the Anglo-Saxons were all Christians, the Vikings were still pagans. The Chronicle constantly refers to the arrival of heathen fleets and the constant battles fought with them. The Vikings had no organized religion as such. Although they were temples and holy places, religion among the Norsemen seems to have been very much a personal matter with each man honouring the gods he chose in the manner which best suited him. This would usually take the form of a sacrifice or votive offering to one of the many Norse gods, 
in return for his favor in battle, or for his help with a feat of arms, or for any one of the myriad daily trials of life. The world of Norse mythology is a strange world. Asgard, the home of the gods, is unlike any other heaven men have dreamed of. There is no radiancy or joy in it. There is no assurance of everlasting triumph, peace or bliss. Over Asgard hangs the threat of inevitable doom. The gods who reside there know that the day will come when they will be destroyed and that although they will struggle manfully, ultimately the forces of evil will overcome them. The chief god is Odin, or Wodan in his southern guise. He presides over the feasts of the gods in his palace, Gladsheim. He eats nothing, but gives the food set before him to two wolves at his feet. On his shoulders perch two ravens who fly through the world and bring back news of all that men do. The other principal gods are equally stern and forbidding. Thor, the god of thunder, Heimdall, the guardian of the rainbow bridge to Asgard, Freya, who cares for all the fruits of the earth, and of course, Tyr, the god of war. Their mortal enemies are the giants who dwell at Jotunheim. All know that final victory has been ordained to the forces of evil, but the gods will continue to resist to the last. Our knowledge of Norse mythology comes largely from the Elder Edda, a collection of wise sayings and legends which somehow survived from Iceland's pagan past. The spectre of the final triumph of evil is omnipotent, and the saga records bleakly, the gods are doomed, and the end is death. This day of doom was known as Ragnarok, when heaven and earth would be destroyed. Idrasol, the tree, which supports the universe, was being gnawed from the roots by a serpent and his brood. On the day of Ragnarok, they would succeed in killing the tree, and the universe of man and gods would come crashing down. If the gods were doomed to die, the same is therefore true of humanity. Within this bleak framework of beliefs, the Vikings knew that they could not save themselves by great deeds and endurance. Even so, they would not willingly yield to the forces of evil. A brave deed entitled them to a seat in Valhalla, one of the halls of Asgard, where the spirits of brave warriors slain in battle are brought by the Valkyries, there to dwell in the long hall of valor. But even there, they could only look forward to final defeat and destruction. In the last battle between good and evil, the warriors would fight on the side of the gods and die with them. This surely was stern stuff for humanity to live by, and it was the absolute antithesis of a Christian gospel with its promise of everlasting life in peace and happiness. The only sustaining spiritual support the Norse legends gave was in the quest for the attainment of heroism. The power of good was seen at its purest in continuing to resist evil while faced with certain defeat. They saw victory in an heroic death and believed courage was never defeated. Evidence of the Norse belief in the importance of courage and valor comes from the Elder Edda, once again in direct contrast to the Christian doctrine of forgiveness and tolerance. A coward thinks he will live forever if only he can shun warfare. A brave man can live anywhere, but a coward dreads all things. This fierce creed made the Vikings implacable enemies who would fight ferociously long after hope had gone, and contemporary accounts of Norsemen at war bear this out. 
The Norseman's religion was, of course, very pagan. It was also inspirational. It was a combination of myths, stories, well-held beliefs, and a great deal of fear underlying it. It was an ignorant religion in many respects with Thor, the great god of war, as the sort of the champion of the gods, Freya, who wove the destinies of men in individual webs and so forth. You have, therefore, this thriving religion, in a sense, so it is a pagan one, which can inspire a warrior culture, because the great effect of their religion upon them was to make them pagans. And, of course, the great dread of their berserker attacks, when they literally, I think, went literally mad with bloodlust, they often cast off all their clothes, all their armor, their helmets, and just went in with their, either their great swords or their battle axes. And by sheer terror and fury, hardly noticed wounds which they sustained. And that was made them so frantically difficult. Because, you see, they believed, like the Japanese did, of course, in the Second World War, that a warrior who died in combat went straight to heaven or to Valhalla, as it was called, where there was endless feasting in the presence of the gods for the brave warriors who had done their butt bit below. The chief weapons of the Viking armies were their fearsome war axes, were their blades of special hardened steel. In most of the rest of Europe, the axe had fallen into disuse as a weapon of war, but the Vikings never abandoned them, and they came to symbolize the Norse terror. In addition to the axe, nearly all warriors carried a sword, and most would have had the wide circular shield some three feet in diameter and painted in a variety of brilliantly colored patterns. The wealthier men in the armies of the age would have also worn a mail coat and helmet, which gave a strong measure of protection against all but the fiercest blows from swords and spears. These were the men who would fight in the front rank of a Viking force. With their shields locked together, they would advance on their enemies. Above their heads would fly the various war banners of the Viking kings, the chief device of which was the raven, Odin's eye on mortal men. Behind the best men came the warriors, who were armed with missile weapons, spears, and bows. Their task was to fire their missiles over the heads of their own front rank in order to cause gaps to appear in the opposing formation, allowing the better armed warriors to crash through the ranks of their enemy where a series of intense hand-to-hand -hand combats would result. The shield wall was a critical point of any battle array. Often the smaller wall would be erected around a particular important chieftain or king. The side which first broke the shield wall of the opposition would generally come away victorious. One of the few descriptions of combat at the time of the Vikings survives in the Brumborough Fragment, a piece of a poem celebrating a great victory won by the Anglo-Saxon men of Wessex, led by Athelstan against a combined force of Scots, Picts, and Vikings. The Vikings, who had sailed over from their base at Dublin under the leadership of Anlaf, fought ferociously. And the Brumborough poem gives a vivid impression of battle in the Dark Ages. Athelstan, Kinning, Eorna Dichten, Beorna Beagifa, and his brother each, Edmund Etheling, Eolda Langnia, Tyr Geschlogen at Sacha, Schweordum Edgum, Im Babrunenberg, Hetend Krungen, Schkeot Liodar and Schifflotan, Fega Fiolan, Felt Donada, Sedges Weta, Sioth and Sun upon Morning Tide, Meora Tungel, Glad of Grundas, Goddess Kondel Beoch, Echtes Drichnes, Ossio Ethele Geschaft, Sur to Settle. Their legs set manic garumajated, Guma Northerner, of a shield shotten, swill shiotish each, wearig weeges said. Wese axa forth, on long near dega, I orad kistum, on last legdum, lathum theodum, here wum here a fleeman, hinden theala, meek and meal and sharpen. Mertha ne wirndon, hiardus hon plagan, helleth an nanum, therethe mit anlaf over earga bland, on leaders busme, land gesochten, fega to gefeochte. Fife legan, 
on them camp steada, kinigus jungus, schweor de maswe feida, swilch sioth and h, eolas anlafs, unrim herigis, flotena un shiota. The Brumber of Fragment was written around 937 AD, by which time the Vikings, a change from being occasional, if persistent, marauders to settlers and rulers of a large part of the kingdom. This was the Dane Law, a Viking area of influence centered on York and covering the whole of Northumbria. The borders of this region were constantly shifting as different kings rose and fell and differing alliances and pacts were made. Ireland also had a large area of Viking influence and Dublin was the seat of Viking power there. In England, during the latter half of the 9th century, Alfred the Great had done a great deal to limit the expansion of the Vikings into Wessex and Mercia. His good work was carried on by his successors, Edward and Athelstan, who was the victor at Brumborough. During the latter half of the 10th century, the frequency of Viking raids seems to have been greatly reduced, probably due to the strong rule of a series of determined English kings. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, for example, records only one Viking raid in the 26 years between 954 AD and 980 AD. As the century moved on, there was definitely a great reduction in both the number and the frequency of Viking attacks against the British Isles. Now, there were two main reasons for this. First of all, thanks to the great staunch reforms of King Alfred, who produced the first really effective Anglo-Saxon army, its first navy, and also set up great fortresses like Edinburgh, all the Burr words come from the fortresses set up in his and later times, the Vikings found they were meeting a very determined opposition and were getting some very bloody noses. So the idea of a soft, easy target of the British Isles, of coming loose and go home with women and all the rest of the baggage over your shoulders, uh, was no longer so attractive. And the same was happening in France, incidentally, where Charlemagne and his successors were all, again, fighting very effectively, not only against the Saracens in Spain, but also against the Norsemen in the north. The second reason, of course, that is the great explosive energy of the Vikings begins to wane. No longer are they so ambitious about sailing over large oceans, looking for new countries, new areas to plunder. They now begin to settle. In the long ships are not only the warriors now, but also the women and children, the old men, the old women. So in England, you have the Dane Law, the area to the north of Watling Street, which is about 50% uh, of England, as we now know it, becomes settled. And a lot of the names of the villages reflect that. And the same thing happens on the continent, of course. They settle in Sicily. They also settle in Normandy, which meant really Norseman country. So you get a period when they stop being roving raiders and become to be settlers and cultivators of crops. In 978 AD, with the ascent to the English throne of King Athelred, some of the iron grip necessary to maintain peace in these troubled centuries seems to have been lost. From 980 onwards, Viking raids and incursions by their armies once again featured strongly in the pages of the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. Athelred had become known to posterity as the unready, although the actual translation of the word unread means ill or badly counseled rather than unprepared. Uh, rash discussions and bad judgments, however, do appear to have played a large part in his story. Ill-advised or not, what is uncontestable is that there was again a huge upsurge of Viking raids on England during Athelred's reign. Concerning the years from 980 to 982, we have the following entries. In the same year, Southampton was pillaged by an army of pirates in seven ships. In the same year, the island of Thanet was ravaged by a pirate army from the north. In 981, Anna Domini, Padstow was laid waste. And in the same year, much destruction was done along the coastal regions in Devon and Cornwall. The next year, three pirate crews landed in Dorset and pillaged Portland. 
These raids were to continue uninterrupted in one form or another for a hundred years to come, sometimes in small raiding parties of three or four ships, and at other times in great fleets in excess of 300 ships. Details of the armies and fighting which took place are naturally sketchy, but we are fortunate in that one campaign in particular is recorded both in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle and in an epic poem. This was the large Viking incursion which resulted in the Battle of Maldon, fought in 991 AD between a Viking force which came in 93 ships and the Essex Feared, led by Elderman Britnoff. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle for 991 takes up the story. In this year, Anne Laff came with 93 ships to Folkestone and ravaged the neighbourhood, went on to Sandwich, he pillaged the country and so went to Malden. Ealdeman Brichtnoch came to meet him with his feared and fought with him, but they slew the Ealdeman and had possession of the place of slaughter. The Vikings had beached their ships on Northy Island, a small island linked to the mainland by a very narrow causeway only two yards wide and 30 yards long. They were opposed by the local Anglo-Saxon feared under Britnoff, who easily managed to keep the Vikings at bay on Northy Island during the early skirmishes prior to the battle. The Norsemen could not forge across the narrow causeway, and the Saxons held them at a disadvantage, and a stalemate soon developed. Then a strange thing happened. The Vikings asked for permission to cross to the mainland unmolested to fight in a fair fashion. Buoyed with success from the early exchanges, the victory appeared to the men of Essex to be already assured. In this confident mood, Britnoff agreed to allow the Vikings to cross to dry land and form their shield wall there. The poet who wrote the epic poem The Battle of Malden 1,000 years ago recorded the events of the day for posterity. By a small miracle, the poem has survived the intervening centuries largely intact. There exists a strong possibility that the poet may have actually been present at the battle. And as such, we are privileged to witness a thousand-year-old battle through the eyes of one of the fighters. We take up the story as Britnoth summons the Vikings to cross from Northy Island unmolested. Ongen jalian tha, ufa kald water, bicht helmets bairn, beornes gelichten. Nu jau is gerumed, gach richna to us, guman to gutha, God ano wat, hwa thera welsh do, we alden moata. Woden thou we wulfus, for witra ne mirnon, weeching a weirod, west over pantan. O for sheer water, shield us wagon, lead man to lander, linda bear on. The decision to allow the Vikings to come ashore to reform their ranks and fight must rank as one of the major miscalculations in ancient military history. These fearsome opponents needed to be handled with extreme caution, and Britnuff and his army would pay dearly for their overconfidence. The battle was furiously pursued by both sides. There on Gaian Gramum, Gear au Stoden, Birtnock mit Beonum, He mit Bordem Hate, Wirken Thoni we Hargen, and that we're on Thialdon, Thester with the Odum, Thou was the Ochter Nech, Tyre er Getochter, was your tide coming, that dare Fager men Fealen Shiolden, Fair word Harima Hafen, Harimas Wunden. Eor Nasses Geron was on Iathom Kurm, Here Leighton Thafulman, Feol Hardish Beru, Gerimmer Gergrunden Agar as Fliogan, Bogan were in Bizica, Bord Ord Onfenk, Bitter was say, Beadores, Beonas Fiolan, On Ge Weather a Hand, Hissas Lagun. Eventually, the Vikings were triumphant in this most hard-fought of battles. Britnoth and his champions and a great number of his men lost their lives. 
The men of Essex were utterly defeated after a long rearguard fight. Their heroic last stand, however, was not entirely in vain, as the final moments of their desperate fight produced for us some of the most inspiring lines of poetry in the English tradition. Britvold, Britnoth's ageing champion, spoke these words of defiance in the heat of a losing battle. He shall say Hiadra, Hiarta the Kina, Mo the shall say Mara, the or Megan leak laugh. Here lieth Urialdo, Allah for Heowain, God on Griota. I, Megan Onion, say the new from this weed plagan, Wend and Thencher, each yom fruda theorgus, from each ne willa, arch each me be half minum, Halaforda. Basue Leofenman, Leechigan Thencher. Malden was just one of a series of disastrous defeats for Anglo Saxons' arms at the hands of the Vikings during the late 10th and early 11th centuries. From 987 AD onwards, almost without interruption, the Anglo Saxon Chronicle records the unceasing struggle between the Viking raiders and the Anglo-Saxons, during which the Vikings generally held the upper hand. In order to try and prevent further bloodshed in the fighting, which increasingly saw the raiders victorious, the disastrous practice of paying Danegeld gained currency. Desperate to stave off further raids, the Anglo-Saxons paid an increasing amount of silver to bribe the Vikings to halt their bloodthirsty practices. Like every good extortionist, the Norsemen knew a good racket when they saw one, and the £16,000 paid to them in 994 AD quickly rose to £24,000 in 1002 AD and stood at an astronomical 48,000 pounds by 1012 AD as more war bands joined the trail to England. The business of paying tribute was quite literally a vicious circle. The more the inhabitants of Britain paid, the more anxious the Vikings were to raid these islands and extract yet more Danegeld in return for ceasing their activities. The lure of Danegeld, of course, had often inspired raids in the first place. The successful extraction of Danegeld from England even became a subject worth noting on a man's tomb. Uh, this surviving tombstone from Upland in Sweden, erected in memory of the warrior Ulf by his sons, carries the runic inscription, Ulf has taken three gels from England, the first that Tosti paid, then Thorkel paid, then Canute paid. The ultimate irony, of course, was that it was Danegeld which paid for the armies of Sven Forkbeard and his son Canute. It was Canute who, in 1016 AD, would become the first Viking king of all England. Previously, England had been split into a number of smaller kingdoms. King Canute's ascent to the throne of all England was attained through a mixture of conquest, bribery and diplomacy, all financed by English silver. However, the reign of the Viking kings over all of England was not to last long. The dynasty would span only 30 years or so. But their enduring legacy is that England would ever thereafter be a single kingdom. With the death of Canute in 1035, he was succeeded by his illegitimate son, Harold Harfoot, then by Hardicanute in 1042. On the death of Hardicanute in 1047, the throne passes back into Anglo-Saxon hands when Edward, the son of Athelred, was crowned king of all England. With Edward's death in 1066, a number of claimants to the throne emerged. The two main pretenders were Norwegian King Harold Horndar and William the Bastard of Normandy, both of whom brought armies to England to claim the throne in the momentous year of 1066 AD. William landed in the south near Hastings 
to begin his attempt at the throne, and Harold in the north, near York. Harold Godwinson became the last Anglo-Saxon king to confront a Danish army on English soil when he took the decision to meet the Viking army first, before moving south to tackle William's Norman army. The battle which Harold fought against the Norsemen, in which the English were victorious, took place at Stamford Bridge. Harold, king of the English, attacked them unexpectedly beyond the bridge. Battle was joined and a fierce fight lasted till late that day. There King Harold of Norway was slain and Earl Tostig and countless numbers of men with them. Then Harold crossed the bridge and made great slaughter of the Norsemen and their allies. Although the Battle of Stamford Bridge is generally overshadowed by Harold's subsequent defeat at the infinitely more famous Battle of Hastings, it is by far the more important to students of Viking history. The defeat of the army under Harold of Norway at Stamford Bridge marks an end of both the Viking kings of England and of the entire Viking era. Never again will the Norsemen play a major role in the affairs of Britain. There was still, of course, a large number of raids and incursions, but as the rigorous order of the Normans was gradually imposed on the country, a new era adorned, and the influence of the men from the north began to wane. The Vikings inexorably slipped from the world stage. Even from a distance of 1,200 years, their potent imagery and the sheer presence of these fierce seaborne raiders still lingers on. For some, those brutal centuries are simply the Dark Ages. To others, who can still hear the seagulls cry on a long wind to Valhalla, they will be forever the age of the Vikings.